So today we're going to talk a little bit about object-oriented programming and its role in influencing the development of agent-based modeling. Uh, but before we get to object-oriented programming, let's talk a little bit about uh, functions in uh, computer programming. So originally, in some of the very early uh, notions of computer programming, a function uh, was simply a something that took a number, did something with it, and then created another out number as an output. Uh, and in many ways, you know, we still think of functions in that way today at a very rudimentary level, and it's what we're often taught in our introductory math classes, right? But in reality, a function is something that takes just about anything, any kind of object, transforms it, and then spits out another object on the other side, right? And so to that extent, it was really John McCarthy's work on Lisp in 1958 that really expanded this notion for uh, computer programming, right? And he built upon Alonzo Church's uh, lambda calculus, which was a functional notation uh, that allowed you to pass a function as an input to another function, right? And in fact, you can still do this in NetLogo today. Uh, there is a, a function, if you will, a reporter object that called task that will allow you to actually define a function as a, as a variable, and then you can pass that variable around to other variables, right? Uh, so, uh, and there are a couple of different NetLogo um, uh, procedures that actually take tasks as input in, uh, and use them as what they do. Uh, and we could talk a little bit about that maybe in the next unit. Um, however, you know, the, the big, one big thing is that Lisp still kept functions and data separate, right, to some extent, the earliest forms of Lisp. There are modern object-oriented forms of Lisp. Um, in other words, you needed, for instance, different addition operators for different data types, right? You couldn't identify, you couldn't define one universal addition operator, right, that would work on a multitude of different data types very easily, right? Uh, and so to that extent, um, the, the, the data and the, ob and the functions were considered separate from each other. The earliest known uh, example of when this was actually kind of broken down was some work by Dahl and Nygaard in uh, Norway uh, when they were developing simulations for maritime ships. Uh, and they created the notion of a class as part of that. So you had a class of a ship and you had classes of parts of a ship, right? And these allow you to combine data and functions into one package to describe what that class could do, right? Uh, and um, this was done in a language that was developed for this purpose called Simula, right? Simulation, right? So I, kinda, I always find it kind of interesting that the original use of object-oriented programming was for simulations, and in fact, we're going to talk about how that eventually leads to uh, some of the notions we take for granted in, um, uh, in age-based modeling. Uh, now, even at that time, though, the term object-oriented programming as we use it today was not used, and wasn't used until the development of Smalltalk by Alan Kay and, and colleagues in 1972. Uh, and one of the beauties about Smalltalk uh, was that it allowed you to define these objects and then have these objects pass messages back and forth to each other, right? And as a result of that, you could then instantiate what those objects would do in response to um, uh, messages that they received, and they could figure out what to do separately. And so you didn't have to like reprogram your entire simulation, you could just reprogram that particular object whenever you wanted to change what it was doing in response to a particular message. The, this notion that Alan Kay develops has a lot of similarities to agent-based modeling. So agents uh, in any modern agent-based modeling, which are often instantiated as classes, so you might have a wolf class and a sheep class and things like that. In NetLogo, we call these breeds, and uh, the current form of NetLogo basically only allows for kind of one level of breeding, right? You can only have turtles and then breeds below that. Actually, in the, some upcoming forms of NetLogo, they're going to have multi-level NetLogo program, which will actually allow, allow more um, what we call namespaces to be generated, allowing you to a lot more fluidity in the space. But, um, but anyways, regardless of that, you still have a low-level form of object-oriented programming available in the current version of NetLogo when you have the breeds. Um, now, the notion of object-oriented program uh, is that these classes contain different data fields, right, and different functions that can be applied to them. That is very, very similar to the notion of how we think of agents, right? We think of agents as being a, a type or an object that has its own properties and behaviors, right? Very much like uh, the way classes are thought of in, in an object-oriented world, right? Now, moving beyond uh, small talk was the work by Carl Hewitt uh, at uh, IBM in 1973 
When he developed the actor model of programming, which was formalized in many ways by Bishop and Steger, and this model simplified kind of the small talk and singular framework uh, to talk about um, a, uh, a, a more simple framework of how to manipulate objects within a computational framework, right? And, and, and you know, as I mentioned early on, all these stories are a web. It turns out that Carl was very much influenced by Seymour Papert's work on body syntonic reasoning and uh, Kay's work on object-oriented programming to develop his actor model programming. Now, actors can only do a few simple things. What they could do is send and receive messages, create other actors, and manipulate those messages, right? Um, and moreover, each actor had an address, and the only way you could send a message to an actor was if you knew their address. And he also put a limitation on the number of addresses an individual actor could know, right? So it had a form of kind of almost bounded rationality where it had a, a limited competency of what it could know. This almost enforced a couple of interesting aspects, right? This enforced things like um, uh, local reasoning and inherent concurrency, right? Because the actors didn't have any knowledge of what their neighbors were doing until after they were sent or received messages. So eventually all of this results in the modern OO languages, right? Like C++, Objective-C, uh, Java, uh, Coco, and a lot of the ABM platforms that we look at. Um, and actors in particular influenced ABM in a number of different ways. First of all, it had this emphasis on concurrent computation. It also kind of forced local interaction spaces, and it had bounded interactions between the individuals, right? They only had a limited number of things that they could know. It was dynamic by its very nature, right? Because you had to be constantly updating these address lists and kind of checking on what's going on. And it kept this notion that behaviors and properties existed within an independent entity, not as a property of the global system around us, right? So there are many ways that the field and the history of object-oriented programming drastically affected and led to, inspired, the way that we currently think about agent-based modeling. And it, it's kind of hard to think of a world uh, of age based modeling that, that exists without some of the notions of objects uh, and object oriented programming that were developed prior to before that. Uh, so, um, you know, that being said, there's not a lot in the NetLogo Models Library that specifically looks at any of these kind of notions of objects. Uh, but what I want to look at is not, in the next talk is I'm going to look at the ANTS model because it talks a lot about local interactions. It's a classic model we haven't looked at in the class yet, and I think it'd be useful for us to take.